much for coming tonight, and um, and thank you again also for coming. Thanks, Michael. Uh, thank you, Tracy. Uh, first, thanks for the invitation to Tracy and the Historical Society for inviting me to talk about Dane's Hall or Dane's Home, uh, as I've been told it's really supposed to be called. Um, and a few things up front. I left this picture up here because it's of the Grand Hotel, which is you may or may not know. Uh, how many people go back at least two generations in Wapaka? Good. Okay, so you know that the building right next to uh, Dane's Home or Dane's Hall uh, to the west is uh, is the Grand was the Grand Hotel, um, and that was the proprietor L. Larson, grandson. He was my grandfather. Yes. So his grandson is right here in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> and as we were digging through Danes Hall in the attic, we found this piece of paper uh, from 1895 from L. Larson, your great your grandfather, and your great grand great great grandfather. Um, that is a note that he had left someplace in the attic. Does anybody read Danish? <laughs> what's in Danish, and I think what it says is that you owe a lot of money to the Danes Hall. <laughs> so let me start by saying, you know, I'm Mike Kohler. Uh, my family is gathered around here someplace. Uh, everybody lives in Wisconsin, in Wapaka, except for myself and my brother. We live down in the Chicago area in Illinois. Yes, we are from Illinois. <laughs> Be calm. <laughs> we are from Illinois. Um, but we have our roots right here in this town of Wapaka. And so I'd like to first start out by connecting the dots a little bit. And many of you know this connection because I've talked to some people here who actually know some of our uh, ancestors uh, that uh, I'll be talking about. We connect the dots here. And I start back in Denmark uh, when two families, the Sorensen family, came to Wapaka in or Wapaka area, of Wisconsin, in 1886, and then the Holst family came in 1877. And Peter Holst, who's seated here on his porch, Peter Holst was actually a very well-known name in Wapaka back in the uh, 1800s and the early 1900s. Um, and the reason you don't know the name Holst today is because if you look at that picture, beside Peter, they're all women, so the name doesn't carry on. Um, Sorensen name still carries on. This is the Sorensen family, and the one way up there in the corner is Jen Sorensen, or James Sorensen, as we know him. Uh, that is our great-grandfather, uh, and that's him standing in front of his farmhouse out here in uh, just east of town on E, County E. You go out about, what is it, a mile or two out, and you'll see Sorensen Lane, and there's two farms there. They have Sorensen's on one side with the beautiful gardens, and then the, our great-grandfather's from was on the other side. So that's our connection. And these two, uh, Stina Holst, so Peter Holst had a sister, that's Stina. She was a seamstress in town here. Uh, Stina and James got married and had three children. Three children, Harry, Martha, and Saren Sorensen. I always think the sing-songy names of the Danes, you know? <laughs> Saren Sorensen. Um, Martha would eventually migrate out west at various schools. She was a teacher. She migrated out west to the Dakotas and ended up in Seattle, Washington, which is where she spent her life. Uh, Saren came down to the Chicago area and worked in uh, pediatric kind of nursing, I guess you would call it, uh, down in Chicago area. Got married and had her family down there, and so that's why I'm down in the Chicago area. Um, and then her brother, Harry, actually had the farm here in the dairy farming up here in Wapaka. And Jim Sorensen continued the dairy farming uh, out there on County uh, E. And so that's our connection to Wapaka. And so we still, we never, yeah, I always say the anchor was really s stable here, and so we keep getting pulled back to Wapaka. We've never really left Wapaka, and that's our connection to Wapaka for many generations. I put this out here because this is a famous picture down here, you'll see it every once in a while, uh, of Main Street. I love this picture, it's in winter, cable cars, you got the horse drawn sleds, and the best thing about it is there's Peter Holt's grocery store right on Main Street. Um, and that's his grocery store up there. So he had a grocery store. He came to Wapaka at the age of 14 in 1877. I don't know a responsible parent who would do that. <laughs> Send your child from Denmark to the wilds of Wisconsin at age 14, but they did. He would marry J Laura Jensen, who was actually a Wapaka resident, uh, and they would have this grocery store in Main Street. Uh, eventually, Peter would bring his sister, Stina, and his mother, uh, 
Uh, we called her Bolstina, Bolst here, and Bolstina lived in Wapak well into her 90s. Uh, they're buried out here in Lakeside Cemetery. Um, Peter was actually a very uh, industrious businessman. He ran the Businessmen's Association. Uh, I heard once you talked about the potato bake. Peter was one of the founders of that potato bake concept, uh, trying to promote the potato industry. He started a real estate business, an insurance business. He actually was the president of Wapaka Building and Loan Association, which became Wapaka Savings and Loan, which became Homestead Savings and Loan, which became today the Chase Bank, which stands, stands on Main Street. So he was the president of that bank until 1945 when he died. Dad was sportsman. Uh, he had tennis, he loved tennis, and curling. If you look at some of the old articles about curling way back in the days, you'll see Peter Holtz was always competing in tennis. And he was the treasurer of Danes Hall. That's our great uncle. His home still stands on Pleasant Street, 206 Pleasant Street, uh, just a few blocks. Here you see him at his tennis courts, which he also had on his property. Um, but that's the whole uh, home. It's still there, up on Pleasant Street, just a few blocks from Dane's Hall, or Dane's home. I'll keep saying that. <laughs> I've been told it's not Dane's Hall. And the reason we did, by the way, call it Dane's Hall is because that's how it's registered with the National Park Service. So that brings me back to Peter Holt's home, uh, a couple blocks from Dane's, Dane's Hall, and that is where we're going to start tonight's talk, which is about Dane's Hall. And I really have to say, much of the information you're going to see here today is information that you've all collected, and you've made it available. You've either shared it with us, or it's on the internet, but you're really the collectors of this information. I just organized it uh, for tonight's presentation. I have to say, I have uh, a strong interest in history, but I'm more interested in knowing what we're going to do with this building so that the history 100 years from now talks about what we did here today and what we did with this building and kind of a continuation of the story. And there's a lot of things that occurred here early on uh, in this, but this is really a story of more than just a building. This is about the immigrant Danes. So now I'm going to ask, raise your hand if you have any Danish heritage or lineage. And that's the story of Wapaka. It's a deep Danish heritage. And yet it's not well known. And I'll talk a little bit later about why it's not well known that this is a Danish community. And then, by the way, I get invitations lately to talk across Wisconsin about this building. And I do give the talk. And most people say, I never knew what pack was Danish. And there's a reason for that. <laughs> but they also uh, work to build a culture in Wisconsin. And much of the culture of the Danes is part of the culture of Wisconsin. And then they weaved into the American fabric uh, so that we know it as Danes. It stands at the north end of Main Street. Um, I only put this in there because everybody in town knows, of course, it's at the north end of Main Street, buddy. It's at the north end of Main Street, uh, near Nels, uh, right next to Nels Rasmussen Park. The Rasmussen's are here all over, I see. Uh, um, and that was where the first settlers uh, settled, right here in this area, right here. Uh, the site is actually what I've been told was the, where the first home was built in Wapaka, uh, Cooper. Uh, and it is at the end of the granite ledge of the Wolf River Bathal Ledge, which is the geological formation that comes right into the Wapaka and basically stops here. Uh, and that's where we get our granite from. And the river suddenly drops at that point, as you see the park drops, about 30 to 40 feet. And that's an obvious place to put a city, because that's power. <laughs> that's where we get our power. And this building has stood for 124 years, since uh, 1894. And it really has seen a lot of the history of the town. Everything from the horse and buggy days on Main Street to our parades of today, you know, the days when Peter Holtz had his grocery store and the trolley went by, and of course the days, uh, the winter days, I love that cannon picture. The cannon used to stand there, it's now out in the um, veterans home. I'm going to warn you that I have to keep going fast because I have so much to tell you. But, okay. You know, it's also been a place where if you stand on the top of that hill, you see so many pictures taken from there of soldiers going off to war and the soldiers coming back, and the people coming back for more. It's really a very historic site in itself, just for the city. It's what happened here that is more important than just the building. That's at least my opinion. Um, here is, you know, the First World War, Preparation Day in 1916, getting prepared for the war, and the welcoming home after the war was won, um, and going off to World War II. Very, very historic location where the city really has seen its, its uh, history unfold. The day's going from horse and buggy on Main Street. And I like this because there it stands there with the horse and buggy days to the days of the um, Yellowstone Trail passing by and the cars becoming uh, transportation routes. There's the circus passing by, elephants. 
I mean, it's really a, it's just a wonderful place, and that's really why I take such an interest in this, because I was so afraid they were going to tear that building down. Um, and I said, no, we've got to do something about this. So let's talk about Donetsk Heim, or the Danes' home. Yeah. 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 I'm not Danish. I, by the way, <laughs> does anybody speak Danish in here? I asked that before. It is the most difficult language ever to speak. It just is a very, very challenging language to speak. Um, so, but uh, the Danes Home Society, and what is the Danes Home Society all about? Um, let's go through a little bit of history. In 1877, the Wisconsin uh, Central Railroad had just completed its route up to Ashton, Wisconsin. So all the people who were working on the railroad really had nothing to do, especially the young men of Wapaka. And the citizens, or the parents, I should say, or the elders were concerned about our young men who were hanging out in the saloons. And you have to go back to that day when you had very conservative Lutherans running the town. And that was just not acceptable. So they formed a society that was going to be uh, built on social and for social and literary purposes called the Danes Home Society. And the purpose was to have them read their Danish, learn their Danish literature. I have to tell you that back then, let's go back to the 1800s. Back in the 1800s, these people didn't come here from a country that was destitute and and had nothing going on. Denmark was going through what is known as the golden age of Denmark. It was a great intellectual society, very brilliant people, great literature. You're talking about the Hans Christian Andersen era, you know, the great astronomers, the great scientists of Denmark. Uh, it was really a high society. The problem was, is it was a monarchy, an absolute monarchy, and a social class, and if you were in the upper class, you were well educated and did well. If you weren't, you ended up coming to Wapaka. <laughs> uh, but these were not, these, these people knew their culture. They were very big into music, very big into song, very big into literature. And that's what they wanted to have this society uh, be about, was for literary and social purposes. Uh, they also, as part of that, had an insurance program. Uh, the insurance program was based on the fact that most people didn't live very long back then, and so you had a lot of widows who needed to have some kind of insurance after their uh, spouses passed away. And in digging through, beside finding the Larson documents, we found in the attic there some documents, of some of the old insurance documents. This one, of course, declaring, Dr. Horn declares that John Yorkson actually did have cholera for two weeks and is entitled to some insurance premiums. I don't read Danish. We will someday. But this one here is a report from the Danes Home Society, and it's about Soren Peterson, who I am assuming is dead, because what it talks about and what I can read in Danish is the fact that H.G. E. Holly was the undertaker, and he cost $43, same as today. Um, <laughs> pastor Solom was the pastor, he was paid $5, and the cemetery, so Kierkegaarden is actually the Danish word for cemetery, his lot cost $15, so I know he's dead. <laughs> um, but this is a tabulation of the Dane's home as the cost of, of things. So it was an, ins they had an insurance program going there. The building you see there today is not the first Dane's Hall. The first Dane's Hall was actually uh, from 1882 when the county was building a new courthouse. And the Dane's Home Society, who had been in three other buildings, they just rented space above some of the stores. Um, and it seemed like every time they rented a space, the building burned down, they moved to another space. <laughs> um, but they actually bought the old courthouse and moved it from Courthouse Square here, two blocks north to where the property is today. And they moved that, and you can see it's sitting here. That's the original Dane's Hall building. Shown up here, I think, is a more interesting picture, although a little bit yellow. But the interesting thing about this is you see above the window here, DDH, Danska Hem, uh, for the Dane's Hall. And if you really focus a lot, you'll see in this picture the Danish flag in front of the stores. So we know that it was a Danish community here. It was very strong Danish. They were very proud of their Danish culture and heritage. Also, if you look really, squint your eyes really hard, you'll see in this picture here two flags, the American flag here and the cross of the Danish flag right there. This is the Danes Home Society men in their uniforms and the city band was playing for them. Uh, on whatever occasion this is, and I'm not sure, I suspect it was June 5th because that's Danish Constitution Day. So they would have celebrated Danish Constitution Day. So that's the first Danes Hall that was built. That building uh, eventually uh, was replaced by the new building we have there in 1894. 
when the society was growing very rapidly, more Danes kept coming to Wapaka. We'll talk a little bit about the reason for that, why so many Danes ended up here. Um, but they decided to put a new building on here, and it would be designed by William Waters. And I know you've talked a lot about William Waters because William Waters is all over this town. He's got more buildings in this town than I think, except for Oshkosh, he's probably got more buildings here than any place else except Oshkosh, which is where he worked out of. But they moved that courthouse over here. This is Water Street, right along the river. It's no longer there, but they moved across the street and was used for retail purposes for many years after the Danes gave it up and put it in that location. This is a newspaper article, the Wapaka Republican, from April 28, 1894. And the reason this building is so, this article is so important is it actually describes what the rooms were in this building. Because it sat for almost 50 years with nothing going on there, and we didn't know what all the rooms were. But I really wanted to return to the day as much as we could, keeping in mind that we had to be practical and be contemporary and make it for the future. But it described things like the reading room is 23 foot by 24 foot. So we knew what that was, because we could measure the rooms. I like this one, a ladies' parlor with a toilet room. That was really novel, <laughs> and only the ladies had that. But we saw where that was in the building, where that space was, and so we know what to put back there. And we'll talk about what's going in there um, next. So it gave all the dimensions of all the rooms in the house, which made it much easier for us to understand where things were, what happened in those rooms. There was a library in there, there was a big meeting room, and of course the grand ballroom up on the top level is described in this uh, document. I mentioned William Waters, and I know you've had talks on him before, but he really has got a fingerprint all over this town. Um, from the Roberts block down here in South Main Street is his. The old courthouse, which you, was torn down, should not have been torn down, but they tore it down. Um, but that was a William Waters. The bank on the corner of, of uh, Main and Union. Um, and surprisingly, there's a little one right here. Which I don't know if you recognize that one. But that is directly across Granite Street. I think there's a pet store in there today. That's a pet store. And that actually is a very historic thing because it's a William Waters building. Um, so that's his commercial buildings. He also does uh, work on many homes out at uh, the uh, lakefront, uh, out at the lakes, in, uh, including, um, oh, these are residences. Residences. Oh, he, of course, he had the addition to the Grand View Hotel. These are some residences, and I know this one's still there. And I know this one's still here, but I'm not sure if that one is still here. Is that one still here? Oh, the Oldborn huh? residence? The, the Oldborn residence? Oldborn's ran them. The mill. Okay. So I don't know if that one's there. I know this one's there because I saw it. I know that one's there because it's the picture there. Grandview, of course, is not there. But he had many, many. He lived on State Street. He lived on State Street? Somebody said? It's your Oldborn. So maybe that's, was that where his house was? I don't know. I don't either. He also was uh, instrumental in many of the buildings out at Dane's, uh, out at the uh, veterans home, um, including uh, the Commandant's house. He designed several cottages out there. You know, we have Marsden Hall, and also across uh, from the uh, across the lake from the veterans home, he also designed Loyola Villa, which is the Jesuits' uh, retreat house across the way. So he's got his fingerprint all over this uh, community, and a very very important architect to this all. So the new building was built in the same location, sitting right here. This is the other William Waters building I talked about, right there. This building here would have been Peter Holt's grocery store. And there's the new Danes Hall in the same location, just a few years, it's not really that far. I mean, this is a picture, but they moved it there a few years after that building uh, was there. Now the next one, actually, I find rather humorous. Um, no, this is the day they opened. This is about the day they opened. So this is announcing and talking about the day they opened. I find this one uh, rather interesting for a few reasons, this article. And a lot of this stuff comes from the local Wapaka Post or the Republican, whatever the newspaper was that was writing about it. But they were they should have their opening, grand opening, on Thursday evening of Thanksgiving on November 29th. And the New Danes Home Building will be will throw open its to the public with dedicating exercises and a grand dance. And they mention who's going to be speaking there, and they mention that it's going to be at 9 o'clock, and that the uh, supper will be served from 11 to 2. And originally I thought 11 to 2 in the afternoon on Thanksgiving. That's 11 at night to 2 in the morning. 
And I asked somebody about that, and I said, why would they do anything so late in the day? And the response I got was, we're talking dairy farmers, and the more important thing in the afternoon is Thanksgiving dinner, milking, and then you go to your celebration. So it was very late that they started this thing, 9 o'clock at night, and it went well into the afternoon. There was a young man from Manoa High School who called us and said he loved this building, wanted to tell us as much as he could about the building, and he actually has a program from the original opening day. And he shared it with us. And the only direction I found from that program was that the dinner was actually going to be served till 3 in the morning. <laughs> so in case you came late, uh, we'll be here till 3 in the morning. Uh, but it gives a great listing of who's going to be uh, attending. There's Oborn, by the way. Um, I'm looking to say there's uh, Lars Larson, of, of your grandfather, is in there. So many of your family is listed in here. Um, I could say, if your name is Hanson, which is probably half this town, um, you're, you're, there's a Hanson on there, too. Um, I know there was a restaurant in the lower level. Maybe some of you remember that. And I think somebody in here said that their relatives actually ran the restaurant. My right? aunt and uncle ran so the restaurant. His aunt and uncle ran the restaurant. Uh, Hanson, Ella. Okay. Uh, it's announced here in 1894 as opening a restaurant. Well, Jenners and Palmer and Jensen, we would like to eventually put a restaurant back in that lower level. That's our goal. We're actually laying it out for that. Hope we can get that done. Meals served at all hours, not going to happen, but we will do the best we can. <laughs> <laughs> but we will do the best we can. They also have cigars and confectionery. I don't know why those two go together. They don't. Uh, I find it much more interesting, the, art, the advertisement above it, which of course is Peter Holst, who had that grocery store, who's offering first class groceries. Um, and anything you want to make fancy meals. Um, so I find that interesting that we tie two of the families. Does it say oysters? Sir? Oysters are served. Oysters. These are Danes, so seafood is big. Seafood is big. I had to, along the way, go, and I, work, I have to work with the National Park Service and the National and the Wisconsin Historical Society on this. And they're not easy uh, to convince of a lot of things. So when I said we're going to put a restaurant in the basement, they said no, unless you can tell me that that's what was there. Well, I showed on the newspaper article and they said, well, that's what they said, but you know that one was there. And so I actually went online and I was Googling, looking for anything I could find out about it, and I found this picture on eBay, a three by three picture, of Danes Hall, and I bought it. And when I put it under a microscope, I found right above the door, restaurant, coffee house. Oh. <laughs> that picture there, if you blow this up, these three gentlemen obviously were waiting for the restaurant coffee house to open, um, but that was a restaurant coffee house, and that satisfied the National Park Service, and they said, sure. <laughs> you do, you have to really dig, and you have to find the information to convince, but it's been fun. It's been fun. This is June 7th, 18, 1895, an article in the newspaper, uh, the Wolfpack Republican, and I find it interesting. June 5th is Constitution Day in Denmark, and they will celebrate Constitution Day. The only other holiday like that that they celebrate in Denmark, big time, is the American Fourth of July. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the largest celebration outside the United States of the Fourth of July is actually in Denmark. There's a story behind that, but that's for another talk. June 5th is a great day for Danish citizens, especially for the Danish Home Society. Uh, the society of, in Wapaka has done itself proud uh, this past year by erecting this magnificent building that has been looking forward to, its fe this, to the festal day with great pleasure. The day came bright and pleasant, but through some misunderstanding on the part of the neighboring lodges in regards to whether they would have free entertainment and free drinks during their stay here, they made up their mind not to come at all. <laughs> so these are free. <laughs> Refreshments are free tonight. Thank you for coming. I always find it interesting that even though we all think the Danes are nice, calm people, they actually did not get along very well. And they argued all the time. And there's good to that, because they really learned to communicate, to work out their issues, and, and develop what became a, what I consider a great society. Uh, the celebration was a success. Even though outside lodges stayed away from the home, the state away, the Home Society has netted a nice little sum to help them out. So, there. <laughs> we didn't lose because you didn't show up. I find that these articles kind of humorous. I want to quickly talk about some of the Danish immigrants because the building itself is a building. 
but it's a story of the people, I think that is very important. And as I've told and looked up and found some of the stories, and I know that many people in this room know these stories, but for those who don't, give me a few minutes to talk about some of the people that were part of Opaca's history that we need to bring back and talk about. And, and, and so if you allow me a little bit of time to talk about them, Reverend Mark F. Sorensen, anybody? Oh, interesting. Mark Sorensen was actually a, pass, a pastor right down the street here. At the Episcopal Church. At the Episcopal Church. He was involved with also establishing St. Olaf's and Amherst. He was very prominent, prominent minister. Very good. Well, you, know, you need to talk to us more because you have more information. <laughs> but he was a, a minister who came here uh, in 18, immigrated in 1844. He came to Wapaka in 18, uh, I think 1857 or something like that. Um, and he came here because of this guy's book. He lived down in the southern part of Wisconsin. He wrote a book on the immigration to, uh, West Ameri uh, to America West, um, and he wrote that in Danish and sent it back to Denmark. And people were so enamored by it because he promised them that, you know, Wisconsin does not hot, fever-ridden, snake-infested, slave economy Texas. So that's one good thing. <laughs> it's not as densely settled as Illinois with expensive land. That's, that's two good things. Um, and Wisconsin has reasonable land prices, moderate climate. If you're from Denmark, it's moderate. Um, and has excellent harvests. So they were really promoting Wisconsin. Uh, has anybody been to Denmark? If you've been to Denmark, it's an awful lot like Wisconsin. You know, when I first went there and I looked around, I was driving through Wisconsin, through Denmark, I thought, oh my gosh, I'm in Wisconsin. It looks so much like that's why this was an important place for me. Well, beside Mark's, Martin Sorensen coming here, even more important was his father, Rasmus Sorensen. Erasmus Sorensen was a, 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 actually a political elite. He was a very elite reformist. He really believed in reform. He didn't like the monarchy, he didn't like the class system. He wanted everybody to be participating in society. He uh, was educational reform, social political reform. He was everything to try to reform the society in, in Denmark. Now, you've got to remember that these people who were under monarchies, which, were, which today are great things, we think, um, but back then they were very frustrated by the fact that the Americans seemed to be making it work without this. Everybody gets educated. And so they had this kind of social upheaval going on in Europe that, well, if America can do it, why do we have to be stuck with this old feudalistic system? He was very upset by that. He decided he was had enough of it, and he was about to head to um, America in 1849. And just as he got to um, Hamburg, which is where, the, where they were leaving to come to America, the monarchy fell. They got a constitutional monarchy. And he decided to go back to Denmark. And there he became a member of parliament. Many, he's well recognized in Denmark as being one of the founders of the constitutional, uh, constitution in Denmark, very well known. Eventually he has not settled himself down. And he did immigrate with his wife and children. And he ended up where? Back in Wapaka. And he started writing back to people himself about the wonders of Wapaka and the wonders of Wisconsin. And he would only went back once, he went back twice actually, he went back once for his daughter who returned there and got married to a Dane in Denmark. He went back and was found to be a celebrity because of all his writings about his ventures in America. And shortly after that he returned to Wisconsin with 150 new Danish immigrants and many Danes, you hear these numbers, of 200 came after him and 200 more came after him. So he was the draw bringing people to Wapaka. He eventually got fed up with America because he couldn't stand the Civil War. He's a social liberal, can't stand the Civil War, we aren't supposed to be fighting wars. He went back to Denmark in 1836 and he died in Denmark eventually. Anybody know of Rasmus Anderson? Well this is probably what I consider your most important person in town. And we need to know more about him. Uh, the Danes came in, and Dane, the, the, the Church of Denmark is actually Lutheran. That's the official Church of Denmark. And Lutheranism was the Danish religion. So when they came here from Denmark uh, with their Lutheran uh, religion, uh, they were getting reports back in Denmark at the mother church that the Danes in America were going a little bit astray. They were attending the Episcopal church down the street here. <laughs> and not only that, but that rabble rouser Sorensen's son is leading them. And so they decided to send over what's called the Inner uh, Mission Society, which was the kind of the, the church uh, 
leadership over there, and they sent Rasmus Anderson over here, along with three others, uh, to try to hold this all together and get them back to the good conservative Lutheran church that we're supposed to be. And they sent him over. In the time frame, does anybody here ever hear the name Grundtvig? He was the key philosopher, social reformer of Denmark of the time. He was a Lutheran minister. Grundtvig. Right? He, def he defined modern Denmark. And he, he defined modern Denmark. He was really a social reformer, religious reformer. And there we had the conflict between the liberal Lutherans and the conservative Lutherans, otherwise known as the Happy Danes and the Sad Danes. <laughs> he was a sad Dane and he looked sad, doesn't he? But Rasmus came to Wapaka actually on a Christmas break from the seminary, um, and he found his call. He was called to service here in Wapaka in 1871. Uh, Pentecost Sunday of 1872, he broke ground on the Holy Ghost Church. Uh, over by the train station. That was the first Luther Lutheran church uh, uh, that he had here. Uh, Pentecost Sunday, Holy Ghost, you can make the connection there. Um, I point this out because you know, Rasmus Anderson um, also had a church in Nina, by the way. So back then, you'd get in your horse and buggy, you'd go to Nina, do your church service there, you come back to Wapaka, you'd go over to New London, do your church service there. So he was all over the place. But this was his main base. And I want to read to you something that I think is very important. There was another person, pastor of the day. His name was Peter Sorensen Vig. And this book was written back in the 1908, uh, translated into English. So Peter Sorensen Vig wrote the history of the Lutheran Church, English Lutheran Church in America. And I think probably the most important line here was their first meeting took place on June 26, 1872, in Wapaka, Wisconsin. So this is where the first Lutheran church meetings occurred here, in Wapaka. I think that's very interesting. Um, because that Lutheran church, eventually they, they, they met their first, uh, um, he, he was, the first meeting was held here. Uh, eventually they met again over in um, 1872, where they formed the Danish Mission Church in America. The first synod meeting was held in Wapaka in 1873. And by 1874, they officially declared the Danish Lutheran Church, Evangelical Lutheran Church is America, as a synod, the first synod here, which eventually migrates itself down to the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, which is the largest uh, Lutheran uh, synod in, in the country. So I find it interesting that this Danish church here had such an impact on Lutheranism in America. Deep history. I mentioned Grundtvig. There's the first Grundtvig uh, up here. The first Grundtvig is the elder. Um, he is, if you, if you want to do anything tonight, go up, look, look up Grundtvig. He defined modern Denmark. And they will say he is the definition of modern Denmark. If you ever hear the Danish folk schools, high schools, you know, we have kind of one here in Wapaka, the Winchester Academy. He was a the philosopher who developed that whole concept of the folk schools. And his son ended up, uh, Grundtvig's son, ended up, he was married in 1882. This is his son here. Um, and he ended, uh, he ended up getting married in 1881. He was then going to go on an exotic uh, trip with his wife heading to Tahiti, but ended up getting no farther than Shockton, Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> it was a big journey. <laughs> And he stayed there. <laughs> he stayed there for a long time. And what he did that was kind of interesting was he was a naturalist. So the Danes of the time were very strong, <laughs> big naturalists. And he wrote lots of books and did beautiful drawings of the birds of the area. And he mentioned his, his book or in his uh, discussions and his, his writings are actually written in official you know, journals of, of, of ornithology. Um, he actually writes in there that I haven't seen this bird for a while, but I know they nest in Wapaka. <laughs> he went on to study these birds. He wrote uh, several uh, books on them. Uh, he eventually studied to be a Lutheran minister and ended up in Iowa. And I think the most important thing about uh, Grundtvig, his son, is that he also, um, he also wrote a book that had was a standard back then. I have one copy of it here. And this was a songbook. So the Danes were extremely big into music. Very big into music. And this songbook was carried by just about every Dane. It is called the, the Songbook for Danes and Amer Danish People in America. 
And so um, I've been trying to collect these, the, the, the music and the songs associated with it. I've gotten copies made by Northwestern University. I put together a copy of the actual two books, the books that they carried, and I put together the music that was with it. That's where they, I, they have copies, by the way. So I'm trying to collect this stuff because it's a, I hate to lose this history. Um, but Danes were big into music. And I just was by our farm today and saw a book that somebody had just given you of Stina Sorensen's songbook um, that she had from back in, what was it, 1885 or something? 1885. So that was kind of cool. Peter Big Sorensen, I mentioned already. Peter Big Sorensen, Peter Big Sorensen was a very conservative Lutheran. Um, he did not get along with that liberal Grundtvig son who was hanging out here in Wapaka also. Um, so these two really had a battle between the happy Danes and the, da and, and the sad Danes. Um, one group wanted to maintain the Danish heritage a lot, and that was the um, liberal Danes. They wanted to build cities that were simply Danish. They spoke Danish, they ate Danish, they sang Danish. It's all, they went to Danish churches, that's what he wanted. And Peter Vig said, no, no, don't do that to your kids. He said, we would indeed serve ourselves and our children poorly by doing everything in our power to prevent them from becoming Americanized. To keep the children born in this country from coming into contact with its language and, its, and life is a violation of nature and will take its revenge in the long run. He did not want them to have their children be Danes. They must be Americans. That's why we came here. They need to fit into society. And by the way, at this time, Europe was on the verge of war, which they always are, <laughs> on the verge of war. And the last thing you wanted to do was to be associated with Denmark, which was always associated with Germany. And we do not like the Germans. And the Danes and Germans never got along. But he wanted them to be American. Wear the American uniform of the American soldier. Fly the American flag higher than your Danish flag. He was very much promoted that. And him and Grudwig just could not get along. And they actually split the church into two. The happy Danes and the Dan Danes and sad Danes. And it was all these discussions, by the way, happened here in Wapaka. And it was in 1892 that Grundtvig and, and uh, Vig met here and battled it out for the future Lutheran Church here in Wapaka at the Synod meeting. And it was there that Vig convinced Grundtvig, just get rid of your Danish People Society, which was these communities he was forming, just get rid of it and have your children become American. And I find it just so interesting what happened here in these meetings, in this place, and actually in this building. So why are they all coming here to Wapaka? Well, when they come to Wisconsin, there were really three main communities. Beside the, the uh, Racine and Chicago communities, there was another community up in this region up here, the Brown County, Winnebago County, and Wapaka County. And then there was the one way over in the west, kind of more associated with the Twin Cities and the, the, the Scandinavian groups over in, in there. And Wapaka was just a convenient place to meet. It was the central part where they could all get to. And so more went on here than, we, than I ever knew about Danish history. This is the picture you may have seen before. It's outside of Dave's Hall. This is the 18, 1908 meeting that I mentioned before where they were bad, where they discussed. This is one of the synod meetings here uh, in Wapaka. There you see Dane's Hall, the kids hanging out. And I'm not sure which one is Vig, but he's somewhere in there. And I can tell by the readings that I'm sure he's probably this one right here because he would be so arrogant he'd be standing out in front of everybody else. Um, so I'm convinced that's him. I actually gave this talk down in Racine a couple months ago, and one woman raised her hand and she says, that was my grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> she did. She's very proud of him though, so she said, please send a picture. Here's the announcement of the newspaper talking about that meeting. You know, the annual meeting of the Synod of the Danish, Evangelical, Danish Lutheran Evangelical Church in America convenes in the city this morning. There will be 400 guests. That's half the size of the town, by the way, uh, meeting here in Wapaka. And they list the program of who's going to be saying services at one of the two Lutheran churches here. And of course, you see uh, Peter Big will be preaching at Holy Ghost Church um, at 10.30 on Sunday morning. So I just think it's interesting to see who, who played a role here in Wapaka. And of course the business meetings will be held in, in the Danes home. And I could give a whole talk on just the Lutherans in this town because of what they did. Literally it was here in this town that you'll see a lot of the universities that were down in Racine developed because of the meetings that occurred here in Wapaka. So it's really more than just a building. I mean this is the Danish heritage and this is the heritage of the town. It was not only used for these kind of meetings of the, of the Danes, but it was 
Also, you know, the hall where the Danish heritage was developed, it nurtured the early Lutheran church in America, uh, Danish Lutheran church in America, is where we had Wapaka High School graduations. The National Guards use it at times for military drills. <laughs> There were political meetings there, theatrical performances, and at one time when the old opera house burned down, it became the Wapaka's opera house of the day. So it really has so much that went on in this building uh, historically. Um, but an expression that I have been told is, you know, we didn't come for a better life in America. Uh, we came for a better life as Americans. And it's a very important statement. They did not come here to be Danes in America. They came to be Americans. And so in some sense, why we don't feel that Danish culture here anymore is because they intentionally got rid of it. They really intentionally got rid of it and tried to make themselves as American as they possibly could. And so the American flag took over. And eventually, because of this rule, to be a member, you had to be a male born of Danish parents, 18 years of age or older, and were able to read and speak the Danish language, which nobody can do. Um, to be eligible for membership, you know, eventually the membership waned. And nobody really cared about their Danish heritage because our parents don't want to be Danes anymore themselves. And so, um, sadly, at the end, it was reported, the end was reported in the Wapaka County Post on March 8th, 1945, Danes home, a Wapaka landmark for 50 years is sold. One of Wapaka's old landmarks changed ownership this week in the Danes Hall. Um, opposite City Hall was sold to Henry Billy, who's got a relative in the room here someplace or some connection. Somebody's worked for you. Somebody's relative worked for Billy. I used to go get my skate shirt from there. So people do know that. <laughs> it had been in the possession of the Danes Home Society for over 50 years. So that's when the end came to Danes Hall. And it really never reestablished itself as a community center for the Danes. So it was sold uh, in, 18, in 1975. Billy sold the operations um, again. And the building remained there empty, abandoned. And you can see it kind of is sad at this point. And many of you remember this, this period. You know, boarded up windows, the, the ballroom ceiling was falling in, and it's really kind of a sad story of, of the heritage that was lost. It did find a new life uh, for a while as an antique mall. And I will give credit to the people uh, who did work on the building at the time. They really kind of saved the building from totally falling apart. Um, but they also made some critical mistakes in the building. For example, they cut a big hole in the middle of the ballroom floor to put a stairway between the two floors. And they also did some serious um, mis improper repairs, which I'll talk about a little bit here. Um, talk a little bit. I'm going to flip through here to get up to some of the repair work. I want to take you through a quick walk through what was there when we got it. But this is as you enter into the main room. Those colors are horrible, by the way. They're not the style of the era. By the way, this was built during Queen Victoria's day. So this is a Victorian um, era we're living in. As you go up the north stairs here, you come in the lobby. If you've been in the building, you come in the lobby, there's a stairway that's to your right, and off to the left, there's two large rooms. The stairway going here starts with four stairs up, and the four stairs go up are for a reason, besides just getting upstairs. The reason we have to take four steps up, and there's a room up at this level, is because that granite ledge rises up underneath there. So they had to build it right into there and they had to get their building and they had to rise up with that granite ledge. And the granite stones are right underneath those stairs. The lower level, you can see the granite ledge in the lower level rising up. And although it looks like the building ends here, there's another 10 feet underneath the stairs, upstairs, where they had to rise up again. Uh, this is where that uh, restaurant dining room was. And we're trying to restore it to that. Um, I just love the granite blocks. You know they took all this material from uh, local granite. In the main level, there's two big rooms there. There's this room here, um, which was their, one of their main social society uh, meeting rooms. And they had this reading room to the uh, um, east, to the west. That's where they had their, uh, their books. And the upstairs, still set up for the antique store, uh, was the big ballroom. Unfortunately, this big stairway in the center needs to be addressed because I just can't stand that thing. <laughs> anything I do in this building, by the way, since it's not registered in the National, the National Park Service, anything I do in this building, we need to talk to the National Park Service and the Wisconsin Historical Society, and we're doing that. I talk to them regularly. We had a meeting with them again today. Uh, not because I'm worried about what they're going to say, but I want to do this right. Mm -hmm. We want to do this right. 
And they've been very helpful and cooperative and supportive of this project, by the way. And we did get approval from the National Park Service in May of 19 of 2017. It took about a year to get their approval to go through our plans of, of what we're going to do. We had two phases. First, outside. I needed to protect the outside of the building first, and then I would start the inside. I didn't want to do them both simultaneously, uh, but I wanted to get that outside secured because it, was, it had some problems. Um, so here's some of the rooms as we're taking them apart, taking down those partitions between there, uh, between from the uh, antique mall days, and opening up the room. The main floor, I like this picture here because these are one of our open houses we had uh, in the main meeting room, and here's the people back in the early days having a banquet there. This was the Yorkson anniversary banquet. Um, and I like this because it gives us a lot of ideas of what it looked like. The most important thing in this picture that has become important, and we don't have any, if you have any pictures of anything that occurred inside this building, please share them with us because this is the only picture we have of an activity inside the building. And the most important thing is this right here, the light structure. The building had electric lights, and they said it was grandly illuminated with electric lighting. That was new in the day. The electric lights had only been in Wolfhacker for about eight years, um, but they put electric lights in there. And I had to look at the lighting package that the uh, restorers were giving me, um, and I said, no, 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 we can't have that. I don't want that. Because they basically had classic chandeliers. Well, 1894, lighting had come out, and nobody wanted candles or chandeliers and things. They wanted these new fancy electric light bulbs, and they wanted them to show them proudly. And so the thing that was important in these things is the light bulbs would face down. They would face down because that's where the lighting was. And they don't have to face upward because we don't have any flames or, or burning going on. So it's important when they gave me, when they look at the lighting packages, that we have this era. And that era, by the way, only occurred for about 10 years when we see the style of the lights facing down in the Victorian style. Because right after 1900, we went to the Art Deco look and everything. So we're trying to capture as much of the history as we can of this. There's the upper levels all cleared up, and the lower level cleared out, cleaned up a bit. And now we have to address this outside facade because there was some serious damage in the outside facade. As you can see, many of the bricks were falling apart. Um, the tuck pointing was improper. Uh, this is, by the way, the cleaning. You've seen the cleaning. It's just an amazing job that they did in the cleaning up of the sink. But we had to fix the sink. There's an interesting history of of the masonry itself, and I'm going to quite try to go through that quickly with you. You know, we we did some work, some research on the the masonry because the National Park, or the Wisconsin Historical Society, said they did all this stuff wrong in the tuck pointing. Whoever did the tuck pointing did it all wrong. I said, what did they do wrong? And they said they used Portland cement based mortar. I said, what else is there? <laughs> and they said you need limestone based mortar. And I said, what's that? Um, and so I'm going to tell you what that is. Limestone, of course, all, lime, all, all mortar and all concrete starts with uh, limestone or calcium carbonate. And I'm going to go through this with you. That's calcium carbonate. I am a chemist, by the way. You know, that's my background. Um, and what they do is they take that limestone and they put it into a kiln and they burn it. And off comes carbon dioxide. They burn off the carbon dioxide and they get what's called quick lime. They mix that with a little bit of water and they get the, what we know is concrete today in some form, and then that gets mixed in with more, with, uh, and that gets set in with cal uh, carbon dioxide from the air, and water gets evaporated, that's the drying phase or the curing phase, and it goes back to the hard rock. And we sent out the, we dug in there with a the drill, we got some of the original mortar out, because that's what they had told us to do. We had it analyzed in a chemistry lab, and they told us that it's regional limestone. Where is it from? More research. We found out that it comes right from here. They used to dredge Marl Lake out of the lakes. And of course, it makes sense that they would bring it up to a good old lime kiln lake, which is where the kilns sat. And that's where they made their mortar. And the bricks were made locally, too. And of course, the granite. So I find it kind of fascinating to find out how they did this. And by the way, we reduplicated that. We didn't dredge Marl Lake anymore, but we did try to duplicate the, the limestone, the sand composition, so we can get it back. If you don't do that, what happens? The bricks of the old were soft bricks. They were soft. They take in water. And if you have um, Portland cement based mortar, that water can't wick out. They freeze and it pops the face off your bricks. 
So you have to have a softer limestone that can let the water wick out and your bricks will be fine. In fact, they've lasted over 100 years until they put that mortar in. So we replaced all that. You also notice that we replaced the siding on the side. That was another research project. I love doing research just to find out how they did this and where we can get this stuff. Metal siding and metal roofs were new in the day. that prevented the buildings from burning. Um, and it would last 100 years. That's how they sold the stuff. And through my research with the National Park Service, they sent me down to Missouri. And you'll see there is a place down there called the WF Norman Company where they actually have these same things from the 1800s where they actually have ropes. They lift up the things and drop down their pound and they pound out your siding for you. Um, and I said, how many do I have to, how, what's the smallest order you can take? And the guy said, one. <laughs> I do them one at a time. And so we had siding made in the original fashion uh, to this. And you'll see it actually turned out quite beautifully. Yeah. Uh, the new siding and the new paint and the new brickwork. Um, it's, it's all to original character. We tried to maintain the original character of the thing. And so there's the before and after. And if you've driven past it, it's, it's quite a thing. Uh, now, the one thing that I've been mentioning many times that bothered me, and you should be happy to see this, but that stairway is gone. <laughs> We've gotten rid of that stairway. <laughs> we had to run new trusses all the way across the building again, replace the old ones and get them in there. But we finally have replaced the thing so that ballroom is now completely open and next we'll be working on replacing the hardwood. So there's a couple things that are going on inside now, just so you know. Um, you know, it is important to me and hopefully it's important to you that we put some modern conveniences in, such as ladies' room and a men's room. Those weren't part of the original thing. The woman had one toilet, but that was it. So we are putting in uh, modern uh, washrooms and also here. Um, they're going over on the east side of the building, west side, west side of the building, in an area that did used to have the women's washroom over there, but we just expanded a bit and it took up much of the old library. It took up about half the space of the old library. Um, the other thing that you'll see going in here is an elevator. So we will put an elevator for convenience for those who need uh, assistance getting up to the ballroom floor. I thought that was important. And we are replacing. Uh, Could you maintain the little the secret door that's there from the balcony down the second floor? I don't know about the secret door, ma'am. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> what, what were you doing with the secret door? <laughs> My father worked for Henry Billy for 25 years. Okay, you're going to have to tell us about that. I grew up playing in that ballroom. Okay. It was in the balcony, the secret door? No, it's right where the... Um, Orchestra loft uh -huh. on the second floor, and then you could go up into the balcony. But just uh, she went to the south of the orchestra pit, and the site is right in there. Hey, we'll have to have you come over and show us. <laughs> it, may, it may still be there. <laughs> we are working on the lower level, the restaurant and uh, the coffee house, so that's now being worked out. You know, I have this uh, really would like to get it back to Jensen and Palmer's, uh, Jensen and Palmer's place. So, what's the plan? I'm going to go quickly through this. Uh, because I am absolutely running out of time here. So quickly going through, I believe that there's a strong Danish legacy that was there. We kind of forgot about it because they wanted us to forget about it. But I would love to bring it back because there's such a rich history in that. And many of their legacies are still here, uh, including the lifelong learning concept. Music and art was a big thing. Ecology is a big thing. The Danish uh, Lutheran faith. You know, I talk about the Winchester Academy. It would be great to bring Winchester Academy connected with this Danish building. I think. By the way, all these ideas I have, I've not talked to anybody about them. <laughs> so there's people who are going to say, you're going to do what? <laughs> Please, be patient when you talk about it. That's what I want, a communication. If you don't want to do it, that's fine. But I think it would be wonderful to connect uh, the heritage well, I'm of... the president of the you know, Winchester Academy. Well, uh, okay, you can talk. <laughs> we should talk. A great, great literary and artistic history from the Danish culture of the day. This is the days of... of uh, Hans Christian Andersen. Uh, these are the days, I have up here Hamlet. You know, Hamlet, of course, Prince of Denmark. It's Shakespeare and British, but it's really Hamlet Prince. I would love to see performances like that performed in that area in Danes Hall or the park outside. Wapaka, believe it or not, has one of the richest music cultures that I know in any small town. It really does. You really have a great music culture. And I believe a lot of that comes from the Danes constantly singing and playing and being in the bands. And, and I have another whole program I want to talk about later this year here, about one of your famous musicians from the town, but we'll get into that another day. I had that song I was going to play, but I'm running out of time. Jens Jensen is another thing. The park next door, the Nellis Rasmussen Park, is an absolutely gorgeous park. 
I really believe it's a gorgeous park. Back behind it is a park called Washington Park, which is not as nice. I would love to see a Jens Jensen inspired ecology park there. And the reason I would like to see that is because I, the young people today really are strong ecology minded people. And I love to get the young people involved in this. Jens Jensen was a very strong advocate of natural landscaping. Has anybody heard of Jens Jensen? Wow, I'm impressed. He's probably one of the best. He's considered the foremost landscape architect in America. Hmm? The clearing. The clearing is his no, in, uh, in Door County. Very good. He developed most. Frank Lloyd Wright, too. He worked with Frank Lloyd Wright. He developed many of the Chicago's big grand parks. A very well known uh, landscape architect. Um, so you all know about him, so I don't have to tell you about him. He did work with Frank Lloyd Wright and Stephen Tyne Mather. Stephen Tyne Mather was the first uh, director of the National Park Services. So these guys all knew each other. They worked together and they developed many grand things around the concept of natural landscaping. And I would like to invite <coughs> Wapaka to think about that Washington Park behind Rasmussen Park, holding into the Rasmussen Park. This is all Danish. Being an ecology-focused natural landscape uh, park. I invite you to think about that. So I would like to see that back part restored along the river and that. This young man here, that's Jens Jensen, the great, great grandson of Jens Jensen. <laughs> he lives in Madison, Wisconsin, and I found him. I said, Jens, come to Wapaka. He's been here, and he's looked at the park, and he says, I will help you. He's a landscape architect down in uh, Madison and you know, Jensen Ecology. So I, it can be kind of fun to connect the fifth generations um, to, to this place. I've mentioned the connection to the Lutheran faith. It's really important uh, and to try to bring that back in. Um, and of course, Danish food. There's a very unique forms of Danish food, including the open face sandwiches, Danish pastries. If you haven't heard of Danish pastries, that's... <laughs> <laughs> then you're, you know, Pringles. I mean, I would love to bring that back into the place and actually spill out into the uh, outside areas, into the parks and things like that. So in closing, I want to say that, you know, hopefully you've learned a little bit that you, you may have known, but I've brought it back or something new to you. I want you to consider for Wapaka that this is a new, this is your home. If you're of Danish heritage, it's your home. If you're not of Danish heritage and you're Norwegian or something like that, you know, or, or if you're British and English, you know, the Danes ruled that territory anyway, so you're Danish. <laughs> <laughs> it's also why we have Bethany in town. Bethany was actually founded by this group. Yeah. Well, they moved it here from yeah. someplace else. Yes, up in, um, uh, I think up in uh, Minnesota or someplace it was, yeah. Yes, that's a very Danish uh, part, of the part of the church. Um, you know, we want to restore it to its original form and function and capture the, not only to capture the history, but to work to build a future for it. I don't want it to be a museum of the old. I want it to be relevant to today. I want it to be a place of song and music and festivals of today uh, so that 110 years from now, people will say, oh, I remember. I had my wedding there. Um, and so we welcome you all to become part of this. Please stop by and talk to us or give us your input. Please tell us your stories. Uh, thank you for listening. And